recently and had the opportunity to meet with some Jewish professional people in Iran. And he was telling me his uh, experience and how basically the, these Jewish professional people are not allowed to go on the bus or the trains, they're going to take airplanes so that they can be monitored by the government. And that this person was also a an academic here in the United States, was unable to have a free moment with these people to try to ascertain <coughs> what their situation was in the United States. So I think some of the themes and the issues that we're going to be discussing are certainly of importance to what's going on domestically in Iran and it's the implications regionally and internationally. So it's a great honor to have Roy here today. As many of you know, she's been uh, in the media on a regular basis. She's helped to collaborate to make uh, various documentary films throughout the media, some of which have appeared on ABC News and PBS. Um, she was commissioned by UNICEF to, to create a film looking at the involvement of underage children uh, in war conflict situations. She is an author and a poet. Um, she writes op-ed pieces for papers such as the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. She's a founding member of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center, which is based here in New Haven. Her memoir, which has been widely received and acclaimed, is about um, a Jewish teenager growing up in post-Iran. Uh, her book is here, by the way, and she'll be happy to sign uh, some copies for you after if anybody's interested. Um, the Journey from the Land of No, which is the title of the book, uh, it was Barnes & Noble's pick of the week. It was Miss Magazine's uh, read of the summer. Um, and all sorts of acclaims of Don Whitney. <coughs> so today, uh, Roya is going to speak in the oh, title. Oh, you are your misery. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Today's uh, theme is... <laughs> Today's title is The Case of Iran Jews Today and the Limits of the Term of Myth Assimilation. <laughs> um, good afternoon. I, you know, I feel like 75% of you have been to my house for dinner, or the rest of you have seen me naked at the JCC gym. So I don't know why we bother with these introductions. Um, I, I have um, some good news and some bad news. Um, the good news is that I'm excited about this talk. The bad news is uh, I have never delivered it before. Um, which means that this is uh, entirely this is entirely experimental in some ways. It's uh, really the result of a whole bunch of other thoughts that I've had, uh, pieces that I've written for various newspapers and um, uh, positions that I've taken, uh, which have not necessarily um, been compiled into one long lecture. But I will do my best today to gather them. Uh, for this purpose. So um, if I'm incoherent, if uh, it doesn't add up, if uh, if I seem to stumble, forgive me, but at least um, the good news here is that it's all fresh and new and I'm, I'm talking about it in many ways for the first time um, here. Um, I was at ADL last night. Um, it was ADL in New York um, has had a series on, on the issue of anti-Semitism in Iran, and I ended up on a panel with uh, three or four people, um, most of whom ended up uh, taking really, really uh, incredibly uh, upsetting and, and disturbing positions. And I found myself um, last night trying to argue, um, trying to basically make a, a, an argument that seemed very uh, unusual for, for those who were there last night. I, I, I basically tried to uh, uh, <coughs> create a coup <laughs> at the panel. And, and here's what, what happened, and, and I think I want to begin with this, because I think um, most of you, if not all of you, are thinking about the Iran, the nuclear bomb, and who's going to strike Iran first. Should it be Iran, should it be, should it be Israel, should it be the United States, when and where and how, and, uh, wherever I go these days, uh, no, and no matter what I seem to be talking about, this, this is what comes up. Um, so I will address it first, because I think in many ways it will take the burden off of all of us. Um, it, will, it will really put forth, you know, it will really be addressing the elephant in the middle of the room. 
and you don't so much have to worry about uh, designing your Q&A questions because here's the question that I think all of you will ask me and I will, um, and you know, let's just say there's an elephant here and address it. Um, I think, um, now, uh, th there's one other warning that I have to give, which is that um, being an Iranian, a Jewish person, and an American, uh, I often find myself referring to myself as we, and people say, which we? <laughs> uh, are you referring to your uh, Jewish identity, to, to your Iranian identity, or to your American identity? Um, so I will try to define it in, in each context, but you have to be careful, because I always assume that, to, to, to me, all these three are, are inherently embedded within, one, within each other, and, I, um, and I, if I lose you, please remind me to, to clarify that. So that's basically how I, um, how I always refer to myself. Um, uh, uh, my, the main point that I want to make before um, I embark on, on the subject of Jews in Iran is, is to say that I think um, we should all, and, and I'll say it as provocatively as I can, um, because I, I think I want us to have a very good discussion. Um, and, and here's my uh, most provocative way of putting it. I think we should all just jettison the nuclear issue and say to hell with the nuclear issue. Um, the reason I say that is because, um, first of all, I'm, I'm, I, I probably have obsessive compulsive disorder. And the reason I say that is that for the past three or four years, for those of you who, who are newsaholics, I have created Google Alert on my laptop. So every day, uh, Google gathers up uh, everything on the subject of Iran and delivers it to my inbox uh, in, in, you know, on my computer. And therefore, you can imagine, I, I receive hundreds of um, news emails about Iran. Anything with Iran in the subject headline, I get it. And, uh, and for the past four years, I've monitored the sort of debate that has taken place around the subject of nuclear issue. And, and, and because I constantly try to um, produce articles and columns about Iran, um, you know, I, I created a file under you know, Google Alert, and I put all of these um, news headlines in there. And I watched to see how, how uh, the news really over the past four years has changed, whether or not there has been a progress in the debate on the subject of Iran, and there hasn't been. If any of you is interested, I'm happy to forward you the file. Uh, for, for the past four years, there have been hundreds, if not thousands, of headlines uh, on the subject of where Iran is going with the nuclear bomb, and there has been absolutely no developments. There are signs of hope. Uh, they all get together and have a negotiation or a discussion somewhere. Then it all falls apart. Then uh, the U.S. begins to uh, make some threats. Then the Iranians kind of uh, say something in return. And then the Europeans say, oh, don't worry, we're all going to fix it. So there are some new round of negotiations. It all looks good for a while. Then it falls apart again, and so on and so forth. So uh, after about three or four years of really watching this very, very closely, I decided that it ain't going anywhere. That basically, uh, and it reminded me of something that I'm sure for many of you who are um, who were around at this time, it reminded me of the story of the hostage crisis in Iran in, in 1979. Um, I think I think that the regime in Iran has has developed uh, a knack for uh, for creating a, a huge stir in news media. Uh, in 79, it was the hostage crisis. Later on, it was the fatwa against Salman Rushdie. These days, it's a nuclear issue. Um, the regime precisely wants the entire international community focused on, on exactly where they want them focused on. And, and that's because it enables them to internally go about doing whatever it is that they want to do. Um, I, I know this particularly well because I, having worked as a producer in television, I was amazed uh, at the amount of coverage that, for instance, the hostage crisis had received in the United States. Uh, but you know, it, I worked at ABC. I, you know, I, I've gone through the entire archive that exists at uh, Nightline, and basically, uh, what what received very little uh, attention around here is the fact that. 
by getting the focus of the international community on the gates of, of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, um, they were able to, basically, the regime was able to quash the democratic, democratic movement in Iran. Um, what you didn't realize is that as a result of, uh, as a result of takeover of the American Embassy, the uh, provisional government that was in power in Iran in 1979, um, which was composed of a group of really well-educated, um, moderate Iranians who, um, who had gone back to build um, a post-revolutionary Iran that was very much, um, uh, very much followed the model that we, we would all in this room be happy about, um, were forced to resign because of their uh, protests, because of the stance that they took against the takeover of the American embassy. This is the sort of news that you missed. Uh, you know, we, we in fact, uh, as Iranians, uh, lost a great opportunity in, uh, after the takeover of the American embassy. And the, the opportunity that we lost was that um, it, it, by, by the taking of uh, the uh, 52 hostages, the focus was entirely on, um, on the 52 hostages. The regime went about uh, its business forced out the moderate liberal er elements from, um, from the re post-revolutionary Iran. It completely annihilated the opposition and, you know, but the international community could hardly care because we were all focused on the 52 hostages. I think a similar scenario is unfolding in Iran right now. The world is focused uh, on the nuclear issue uh, and it's only focused on the nuclear issue uh, there is nothing that the regime would benefit more from than having the entire world community focused on this one issue, which I assure you for the past three or four years has basically gone nowhere. And uh, which is not to say that they're not serious about building a bomb, uh, and it's not to say that, you know, Amalina Jawad and, you know, the, the elite of this regime isn't serious about um, the claims that it's making, but it's to say that um, one way or another, we, as, as enlightened audiences, need to stretch the field in order uh, not to allow this sort of obsessive coverage of issues, in, in order to make sure that, that the field is not entirely a, a nuclear field, and there are other issues that enter this debate. So, um, the, the second reason that I object to, to, the, to discussions about the nuclear issue is that no one has an answer. There were, there were people on the panel last night who were from you know, the most right-wing neoconservative institutes like uh, American Enterprise, and there were people from the Council on Foreign Relations. You, you name it, people were there. And no matter what they said, the truth, uh, the underlying truth is no one really <coughs> has a straightforward answer. No one knows how to address the situation. So <coughs> if we all, you know, some people propose military strike, but at the same time, uh, every military per general or a commander that, that you respect would, would tell you that uh, the way the nuclear uh, plants have, uh, have been built in Iran uh, is in such a way that you just simply can't take them out by airstrikes. That, that they've built them in, in a variety of places, they go way down, you know, and and it, it would be extremely difficult to simply, you know, um, uproot them by by airstrikes. So, um, so the people who say who are in in favor of um, a military operation um, um, are are remiss on the fact that um, military operation against Iran, based on the greatest advice, uh, has been. In, has been called uh, not, not entirely productive and helpful. Um, people who uh, we have seen over the past three, four years that negotiations with Iran isn't going anywhere. So my proposal is um, that, that if, if we are not getting anywhere by, by, uh, by pushing this, on, by pushing the nuclear issue, um, maybe we should just try to Upend this debate and try to look at it from an entirely different perspective. Um, the perspective that, that I'm hoping to introduce today, um, and the perspective that I think we should all be advocating for, is a human rights perspective. 
Um, I think we have tried um, in every possible way to uh, encourage Iran to, to get this discussion to go in a different direction. Um, all sorts of negotiations with Iran have been attempted. Um, when Clinton was in the administration, we, uh, we swapped uh, soccer players and librarians and you know, we sent them cakes and gifts and they sent stuff back to us. We lifted sanctions on pistachios and rugs and it basically didn't go anywhere. Um, um, Madeleine Albright even delivered an apology for the coup of 1953. Um, it didn't really do very much, um, even during the Clinton administration. So um, my proposal is that, that we um, take the nuclear debate out of, the, out of this realm and, and begin to really look at the situation in Iran from, from a human rights perspective and say to ourselves, even if Iranians signed a contract today and, and promised us that they would not be developing nuclear weapons, um, do the rest of us, will the rest of us sleep tightly at peace um, in our homes thinking, oh, you know, they, they, they are not a threat to the international community anymore? And my answer is obviously no, because we know Iran uh, is playing a major role in the unrest in Iraq. We know Iran is uh, playing a major role in creating uh, unrest uh, in southern Lebanon. Uh, Iran is a major supporter, um, if not the inventor of the concept of Hezbollah, um, and continues to be to do so. So um, I say, uh, why are we focused? Uh, on this one particular issue when we have uh, so many other reasons to expand this debate, to look at Iran and say, regardless of uh, what happens to the bomb, we have so many other reasons to believe um, by, by the way that they are violating the rights of Iranians, by the way that they're treating their own minorities, by the way that they're treating uh, women in Iran, that they're not going to be honorable uh, members of the international community. And, let's, and regardless of what contract and what covenant they sign, we're not going to we're not going to uh, look at them as equal partners in uh, in in our debate. So um, this is this is what I wanted to put forth and, and say that ultimately I think uh, the way to go about this and this is basically what our ADL uh, discussion last night came to um, is to say that. Uh, we have to somehow uh, all come to a consensus uh, on the fact that um, Iran, regardless, cannot be, um, will not be an honorable member of, um, of, of the international community, regardless of how they agree to uh, manage the nuclear issue. Um, now, what, where do we go from there is, is tricky because um, I think a lot of the negotiations that need to take place need to take place with with other EU members, not not with Iran. Uh, I think a lot of the conversations that we need to be having um, are the conversations that we need to have with our partners around the world uh, about Iran. Um, but but somehow we think that uh, diplomatic negotiations and diplomacy needs to be conducted with Iran itself. Um, my proposal is that if we agree that we are through with uh, we have done all we can with uh, in pushing the argument forward with Iran. Uh, we should then go forward and, and uh, try to uh, to see whether or not we can bring the entire Europe to our side, whether or not we can create a consensus uh, among our allies as to how to approach Iran. Now, how does this all relate to the issue of anti-Semitism and Jews in Iran? <laughs> well, um, I have to tell you a, a, um, a story first, which is um, I was speaking at the Museum of Holocaust in New York um, about uh, almost a year ago, and um, and after and it was a, a conversation that was completely focused on, on the book. I, I read passages and there was an interviewer and, and he interviewed me um, um, uh, on, on stage. And then there were Q&As and one of the audience members raised his hand and said, 
I've read your book. In your entire book, there is no mention of, of Purim or Queen Esther. Uh, and, and what have you got to say about that? And, um, I didn't really know what to say. Um, I tried, you know, you, you tried your hardest, your darnest best to be polite and, and, um, and, and considerate. So I, uh, the, the best answer I could come up with was that, you know, she came a little bit before my time. <laughs> so, um, after this conversation, uh, when the audience members were coming over to, to um, chat with me and get their books signed, one of them came over to me and said, you're my hero. I have to get together with you. We have to talk. You have no idea what you did tonight. What you said to this man is one of the most important things that I've ever heard. And I really didn't think very much of my own comment. But um, but in any event, he um, bothered to take a two-hour drive from Brooklyn, New York, uh, to to come to New Haven uh, to tell me that the fact that I had told this gentleman that. Um, Queen Esther was before my time, and um, and in fact, I had tried to really say that it's possible to be uh, an Iranian Jew but tell a different story that doesn't include the stereotypes that that you expect uh, to always be told is is something that um, that excited him. And and he said, well, in, he was an Iraqi Jew, uh, or actually son of Iraqi Jews, and he said. I believe there is a grand cons conspiracy by Ashkenazi Jews to, to co-opt uh, and colonize the narrative of Sephardic Jews. I don't know. I, 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 I try to, since you know, we had driven three hours to come up, and, and it seemed to be such a pressing matter, I tried to um, really think about it, whether or not the Ashkenazi Jews were conducting a major conspiracy against the Sephardic to, to colonize their narrative or not. Uh, but, you know, I, I come from a country where conspiracy theories are, are abound, and <laughs> I, I'm basically extremely immune to them. But after I listened to him, I, I realized that there is, that there are these rumors, um, and, and there is this apprehension that one way or another, um, we uh, Jews who come out of experiences post Germany and you know in the last 20, 30 years are are expected to be telling uh, the same story or a familiar story. Um, and instead of thinking that the narrative is is being hijacked or colonized, I thought, is is it possible that we have gotten used to um, wanting to tell each tell ourselves and each other the same story over and over again. And the same story being, we were in some place, things got really bad, they threw us out and we left. And, and do, we want it, uh, do we want that story to be, um, to, to be just that? Or, or are we open to the notion of examining the complexities are, of um, you know that that broad headline, which is "We were there, things got bad, things got bad. We were forced to leave and we left." Uh, are we are we ready to really examine um, what the um, what the uh, many layers and the unexpected other stories that go into that broader headline? Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't look at it as um, by any shape or form as as there being a dominant Ashkenazi narrative uh, trying to colonize our, the Sephardic narrative, but I, I want to say that I think it's, it's important for us, uh, especially when it comes to Iran, to focus on the, uh, on the unexpected stories and, and the unique um, events that drove Jews out of Iran uh, in 1979 and continue to uh, drive the Jews out of Iran until today. And the reason I think that's important is because by, by looking at that, we will see um, that the circumstances that are driving Jews out of Iran are very much the, the circumstances that are driving uh, secular Iranians uh, out of Iran as well. That in many ways, what, is, what has become 
um, a thorn in the side of the Jewish community in Iran is the very thorn that is in the side of um, the secular average Iranians who don't see eye to eye with the regime as well. Um, so, uh, which is not to say that there is no broader anti-Semitism in Iran. And again, which is, it, it is not to say that the situation of Jews in Iran is, is a dire one. But it is to say that um, we are a, an extension of a broader problem from which uh, the rest of the uh, average Iranian secular or non-fundamentalist community is also suffering. Uh, let me surprise you by a few facts that, that you um, probably don't know, um, and, and then um, using those facts, I can kind of um, begin to uh, stretch this conversation. <clears throat> uh, here's a good anecdote. In 1981, uh, music was banned in Iran. That meant that uh, you know the Madonnas, the you know the, the great rock stars and you know folk music musicians of Iran could no longer play. Uh, they would not be aired on radio. They would not be aired on television, and they had no music halls or symphony spaces open to them. Uh, in 1981, I was uh, 15, 16 years old, and I was an avid fan of, of Iranian folk music. <coughs> There was also an organization called the Iranian Student, uh, the Iranian Jewish Student Organization. Um, uh, we used to go there on, on Thursday evenings. Uh, we had we had um, heady debates, and on Friday mornings, uh, Fridays are Iran's day off. We would get together at five o'clock in the morning and go mountain climbing. Uh, Thursday evenings, we generally invited a speaker, and uh, you know the speakers. Um, we're good, they delivered a talk, we asked questions, then we, we all you know, had dinner together and went home. On one Thursday evening, uh, at, at the Iranian Jewish Student Organization, uh, my, my dream of all time came true. I sat at dinner next to the Iranian equivalent of, I don't know, Michael Jackson? Um, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, no, much better than Michael Jackson, at least morally. Right. Um, but but someone who, who I had absolutely adored and admired for many, many years, um, whose music I, I loved and listened to for many, many years, and and he was sitting to, next to me, like you and you are sitting next together, and we actually you know passed the bread to each other and, and had dinner together. Um, and then after dinner, he performed for us. The reason he did that, was because when music was banned in Iran, uh, given that uh, Jews were considered the people of the book, were considered a legitimate religious minority, and uh, they were, and and given that music was not banned in Jewish religion, uh, these musicians who had no other audiences, who had no other possibility of performing anywhere else, came and played for us and for foreign embassies in Tehran. And, and that's the only two access to the audiences that they have. I hope I surprised you. I certainly um, said that in order to surprise you. To say that um, the conditions of Jews in Iran, even after this regime, uh, is a very complex one. To say that they are anti-Semitic would be um, to try to just simplify the story in such a way that you and I can quickly say hello and leave. But it really doesn't shed light on, on the multi-layered, really difficult landscape of how Jews live in Iran today, uh, nor does it really shed light on how we, the rest of us, uh, as American Jews, should be thinking about what's going on um, in Iran with respect to Israel and the Jewish community. So what, what this requires is, is what we, um, as, as you know, users and viewers of MSNBC and Fox and uh, NBC and, and you know, these fast news networks are used to, which is uh, to try to uh, uh, get us to not want a, a quick uh, and a simple black and white answer. Now let me surprise you once again. 
Um, if, if you have a party in Iran and, and the members of the Pastoran or the Revolutionary Guards break into your party and, and catch you drinking beer um, and you are a Muslim person, you would be hauled off and probably receive several lashings and you know, could, could even suffer jail time. If you are a member of a Jewish community, they break into, into your home, you're having a party and you're drinking alcohol, you're good. It's not a problem. Why? Because Jews are people of the book, in their religion, in our religion, it's okay to drink. So we can't have wine and we can have drinks in our homes. Um, does this mean that we have cushy lives and you know, a, a wonderful uh, certain, you know, condition? <coughs> no. No, not by any stretch of imagination. It is just to say that when we say that the condition of Jews in Iran is a bad one, um, we can't just make a blanket statement. We have to say, which aspect of Jewish life in Iran are you referring to? Are you referring to, um, uh, to, to you know, the progress of Jews in the academia? If that's the case, yes, it, the conditions are very bad um, uh, for all the people um, especially the Jews and members of minorities who cannot uh, go through the moral and ethical and religious component of the entrance exam that everyone is required to take in order to enter university. Um, <clears throat> the Iranian government since the 1979 revolution um, has, uh, in my belief, uh, has been very equivocal as to what it really wants to do with, with the Jewish community in Iran. Um, the reason is, in, in the beginning of, in the first few years of the revolution, they, uh, Jews were banned from leaving Iran. But if you actually confronted uh, a, a passport official, a, a customs person, and said, uh, have you confiscated my passport, or are you going to return it to me? They would not say we have confiscated your passport and, and you're going to be, uh, you're going to live, uh, you're, you're banned from leaving Iran. They would say, come back in three months. You go back in three months and you would say, can I have my passport now? Um, or are Jews banned from leaving? Oh, no, 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 Jews aren't banned from leaving, but would you please come back in four months? So the point that I'm trying to make is that I think the regime up until this point uh, has really not not made a decision what it wants to do uh, with this particular Jewish community. Does it mean that um, uh, in and, and the reason that happened was uh, back in '79, um, Ayatollah Khomeini uh, was met by a group of Iranian Jewish leaders uh, who made a special trip to his home in Rome and sat down to have. To, to hear it from his own mouth, whether or not, whether or not um, he, he thought that because of his hostility against Israel, the condition of Jews in Iran was going to be a dangerous one. Whether or not, uh, you know, in 79 he had decided that just like he wanted to do away with Israel, he also wanted to do away with the Jewish community. Uh, the community leaders ma made a trip to his home and um, maybe I should read you a, a couple of pages. How much time do we have? <coughs> uh -huh. um, I can read you a, a short passage about that meeting. Um, uh, six people get together. This is after uh, a, a highly regarded uh, the, a leading Iranian Jewish um, a person had gotten executed along with the first round of you know, um, uh, affluent Iranians who were being rounded up and executed in the, in the first days of post-revolutionary Iran. Um, Habib el Ghanayan was his name and uh, he was a huge philanthropist and actually the man who brought plastic to Iran. So um, his, his execution was in, in many ways hugely symbolic that um, the entire country, to, to some degree, felt indebted to him as, as a person who um, was not only 
a, a successful businessman, but an entrepreneur and someone who had um, introduced uh, an element into Iranian life that had not been there before. After the execution of El Anayon, the entire community was thrown into disarray and, and thought that maybe this is the plan for the rest of the community as well. So uh, the mission went to Ayatollah Khomeini in Guam and, uh, and uh, really confronted him and said, do you, what, what's the story? What do, you, uh, what do you want to do with us? And Khomeini uh, kept the six people who had gone there for about three hours and he delivered a long convoluted speech um, about copulation. <laughs> it, it had nothing to do with Jews, Iran, or, or anything that had to do with the laws of matrimony and, and when and, and why it's good for men and women to get together at certain times of the month. So uh, the group is, is entirely befuddled and, and very, very confused and they're really worried that this is his way of saying, you know, just go away, I'm not interested in, in, in addressing your concern. But at the very end of, of that uh, bizarre speech, <clears throat> he makes a segue and he says, In the Holy Quran, Moses, salutations upon him and all of his kin has been mentioned more than any other prophet. Prophet Moses was a mere shepherd when he stood up to the might of Pharaoh and destroyed him. Moses, the speaker to Allah, represented Pharaoh's slaves, the Mustazafin of his time. Now, Mostazafin was, was really the equivalent of the world proletariat that Ayatollah Khomeini had, had uh, borrowed from uh, the Marxist vocabulary and introduced uh, and, and created the, the Arabic equivalent of it uh, and constantly used it. So when, whenever Ayatollah Khomeini referred to anybody as, as a member of the Mostazafin, it meant that, you know, that person was a celebrated person or was with, with the okay crowd, as far as he was concerned. So the moment he, he, um, he invokes uh, the, you know, Mostazafi, the, the six Jews who had gone there knew that this couldn't be so terrible. And, and then he continues to say, Moses would have nothing to do with these Pharaoh-like Zionists who run Israel. And our Jews, the descendants of that Moses, have nothing to do with them either. We recognize our Jews as separate from those godless, blood-sucking Zionists. <laughs> well, it sounds very harsh to you and me, you know, here in New Haven in the United States, but at that time it, it was a, a huge relief to the community who had gone uh, to receive some, some word of assurance that the plan was not to do away with the entire Jewish community. Um, the six, uh, you know, the, the 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 mission brought back that one line and and um, and then painted it um, that one last line that we recognize the difference between uh, our Jews and those godless Zionists uh, on the paint they painted it on the wall of every Jewish school, every synagogue uh, throughout Iran, especially in Tehran. Where so we we used to. You know, march to our class in school looking at these slogans every morning and kind of bowing to them. So, um, that, that distinction that Khomeini made early on in, during the revolution really uh, uh, was, was an issue of policy. And, and what it meant was that Jews were going to uh, be unharmed, but that didn't mean that um, various opportunities were not going to be denied them. But what I'm, what I'm trying to encourage us to think about is that you're talking about a, a country and a situation that, um, in which uh, Jews have, uh, uh, being a Jewish person at times can actually be to your advantage than being a secular Muslim person who, um, who seems to be in disagreement or has <coughs> Has a political uh, has a, endorses a political opinion other than that of the of the regime. That um, in one instance, when uh, this group of the Iranian uh, Jewish students and I went on a uh, some of you who have read my book may may remember this scene that we went mountain climbing um, on a day that was actually a day of mourning in Iran. 
uh, all of us considered ourselves, um, you know, radical liberals. And and somewhere in the mountain, uh, a group of Revolutionary Guard members who had tried to close the mountain. Now I don't know how exactly you can shut down the mountain. It's sort of like you know telling Niagara Falls not to fall exactly. Um, or something of that sort, but they did try to actually shut down the mountain on that day, and, and of course the mountain being so vast, we we just you know found a way up, and somewhere half half our our hike, the, they stopped us and said, you know, you you are violating the close the mountain rule today, and we're going to round you up and take you away. They took us away, and we were to the headquarters and. We were there, and they had found some books and, and literature on us that, that were unsavory uh, by their standards. And, um, and those books and literature could have caused, um, you know, could have, could have been the very reasons for, um, for those of us on whom they had found this, um, for detention, arrest, at least several days of uh, questioning and interrogation. But what happened was, uh, somewhere along this conversation that they were having with one of us, um, and I, uh, among them, they discovered that we were Jewish. Uh, I, had, I had something. My mother had put a piece of uh, a, 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 pr a traveler's prayer in, in my knapsack um, for safekeeping, I mean, for, because she was always afraid that I would go mountain climbing and fall or something. So. She had slipped this prayer in, in, in Hebrew in, into my bag. And the guy who was going through my knapsack found it and, and said, what is this? And I said, it's Hebrew. And you know, he said, are you Jewish? And I said, yes. And he said, all oh, the rest of you are Jewish. And I said, yes. And he said, oh, Jews don't care about politics. Go home. Um, I mean, it, it, was, it was absolutely, obviously untrue. We, we all uh, were incredibly politically active, or so we thought of ourselves. And, and uh, the kinds of material that they found on us could have been grounds for serious arrest, uh, you know, had, had we not been Jewish. But, but, you know, sometimes reverse stereotyping and reverse discrimination also works. And in that case, we were all released. Um, whereas a lot of my uh, Muslim uh, counterparts who had been found with similar books and you know, audio cassettes and stuff were taken away and, and some I never heard from. Now, I, I want to end this, uh, this talk today by saying that I think Iran gives a very, very rich and, and historically important and perhaps unique, at least in modern times, for Jews to make a very different kind of argument, for us as Jews to make a very different kind of argument uh, that we have never made before, uh, or at least not in modern times. And Charles, who watches <laughs> these, these talks on a regular basis, can tell me to go to hell because I just don't know what I'm talking about, and I would be happy to hear that. Um, but, but the. I think the, the opportunity that Iran provides us as, as uh, Jews who are enlightened, who want to see uh, a peaceful solution to this uh, very serious problem, to see our own situation and, and dilemma precisely as what it is, as not uniquely targeted at us as a Jewish minority, but really an extension of a more a wider and more serious problem from which the entire Iranian society that doesn't endorse the regime is suffering from. Now, this does not take away from the seriousness of the threat that they pose to Israel or the threat that they pose to the Jewish community. But what it does is that it, it really reveals this, this very complex situation for what it is as a situation that, after 30 years, the Iranian people at large are, are the people that I'm sure those of you who are following uh, the news of Iran have seen the Iranians are the only ones in, in all of the Middle East who are extremely pro-American, 
I don't know any any journalist who, has got, who hasn't gone to Iran and, and not returned saying, I'm amazed at, at, at the great reception that we received. And Iranians are the only nation in, in the entire region who, unlike all the rest of the, uh, their uh, neighbors, are beginning to be curious about Israel. I'm not saying are beginning to be pro-Israel, but I'm saying they're beginning to be curious about Israel. That's not because, you know, they, they suddenly have, have changed, uh, you know, the textbooks and, and are having positive uh, propaganda machine. It's just that after 30 years of having recycled and, and manufactured various propaganda and not really delivering on the promises of the revolution, the public is extremely suspect of the regime's propaganda. If the, if, the, if the regime today makes a declaration that it's at night, the public will probably think that it's, it must be day. If the regime points to the sun and says, look, it is day, the public would probably consider that it's, that it's nighttime. Um, it's, this, is, this is entirely the result of 30 years of, of of, of a revolution that has come to a dead end and has been unable to make its good on its promises. And as a result of it, the Iranian nation has turned into a nation that is highly suspect of its regime propaganda. For those of you who followed, let me just remind you, because I'm sure you've seen it, um, and I think it's relevant to our conversation, so I want to remind you, if you saw the coverage of the uh, Hezbollah war in Lebanon, over the last three, four months. Um, the New York Times had a lead piece um, by their stringer in Tehran. And the I forget the exact wording of the headline, but the reporter was saying that Iranians are the only people in the entire region who are, who are not supporting the Hezbollah and believe that they don't wish for their government to be funneling money outside of their own borders and giving it to these other people elsewhere because they had more needs and they they were suffering economically why support the Palestinians when when your own people uh, need it most um, that coupled by for those of you who read New York review books and are fans of Timothy Barton Ash he came back from Iran last year and and said that Iranians have developed healthy curiosity towards Israel. For those of you who blog and are interested in, in the blogosphere, the father of Iranian blogs, the man who started the first Iranian blog, was a journalist who decided last year to hell with regime's uh, propaganda. He was going to go to Israel on his own and see what's going on there. He did. He spent about two months uh, in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Uh, there was not a day that um, an op-ed didn't uh, print in Jerusalem Post and, and other major Israel dailies, Israeli dailies talking about this guy's trip to Israel and, and what a wonderful time he was having. Um, he, of course, can't return to Iran, so he's sort of <laughs> blogging from Canada but, uh, <laughs> nowadays. But what I'm, what I'm trying to leave you with is that I think there is a wonderful opportunity here for us to, yes, look at Iran and, and the regime in Tehran with all the seriousness that it deserves um, because it's, it's a menace and it has to go. But also, you know, look past the regime and really see the grander, more historically uh, durable change that has taken place, which is really the introduction of, of an, a movement of enlightenment um, from Iran. Uh, you know, if, if you do away with, with Ahmadinejad, if you do away with the president, then beneath it you have a people who 30 years ago wanted to test the dream of having an Islamic theocracy. The rest of the region is consumed with that dream now. The Pakistanis want to know what it's like. The Iraqis want to, to give it a try. 
the Afghans keep wanting to give it another try. Iranians are through. They tried it for 30 years. It was no good. They want to do away with it. They, you know, 10, 15 years ago, um, one of the leading philosophers of Islamic reform came out of Iran and said, we've got to reform our religion. I think we have a fantastic opportunity, also as Jews, to look at the situation of Jews in Iran, history of Jews in Iran, and the dire circumstances of the Jewish community in Iran as an extension of, a, of the bigger problem that Iran is suffering from, and therefore find uh, a universal cause in something that we, we um, are, are accustomed to just attributing to us and us alone. I'm happy to take questions. So in a sense, my question is about context. Because I remember I was doing uh, research on youth unemployment in Quebec, and particularly focusing on minorities and minority nationals in Quebec. And I wrote it in Quebec at the time, it was about 15 years, 12 years ago, youth unemployment in the African community, community or the black community was 60%. And I gave a paper um, at a nationalist university in the of Montreal at a very nationalist uh, department that dealt with ethnicity and society. And I gave my paper. And they accused me of coming from an Anglo perspective with more emphasis on identity rather than the collective identity of Quebec society. And the people used reconstruction to say, well, the black youth in Montreal and Quebec are English and French. They're male and female. There's Haitians, there's West Africans, there's North Africans. So they, they sort of deconstructed away the community. And at the end of the deconstruction said that my paper was incorrect because the problem didn't exist because the community didn't. Are you just being polite? <laughs> no, no, so, you want to say that? No, no, so my question is, you know, it, 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 how do you focus on the context? Because on the one hand, the, the, uh, I think most people realize that Iran is a rich civilization and culture and it's a dynamic society. And there is a reform movement around. But how much time is there? Because in a sense, I, I believe, and Dijon and the regime and the Ayatollahs, the supreme leaders, have made statements repeatedly about the nuclear bomb and trying to work with Israel to fix Europe, et cetera, et cetera, and it's a real threat. So how much time is there? Is the reform movement strong? And um, no, I mean, it's a, it's a greatly valid question. Now, how much time is there? I don't know, but, but people who are supposed to know don't know either. I mean, last year, uh, the MI6 and the Mossad printed a story, I mean, um, came out with a report that, that ran in, in the Washington Post, and then everybody else picked it up, which was, Iran is 10 years away from the bomb. I don't know. I mean, this is as, as recently as last year. They were supposed to be 10 years away. Are they closer now? Well, maybe five, six years away. The point is uh, that I think um, with, with what's going on in Iraq and, and in that entire region, it's very, it's very obvious, I think, and, and we all know that um, uh, without even you know, having, you know, it's, it's unnecessary discussion that just, just nobody can afford to go into Iran. And uh, in addition to that, Iran, uh, I mean, the, even airstrikes or military occupation of Iran in any shape or form, the, I mean, not military occupation, but airstrikes against Iran doesn't really guarantee uh, the wiping out of, of the nuclear <laughs> facilities to, in a very effective way. So what that really leaves uh, as a possibility is to try to enable, uh, uh, in, in whatever shape or form that we can, uh, not the reform movement, because I think the reform movement as the press covered it, you know, 10 years ago, is dead, you know. But try to find a way of enabling a nation, or empowering, rather, a nation that has, in every possible way, showed its dissatisfaction with the regime. I mean, there was the largest, one of the, the second largest uh, labor strike took place in Iran about a year ago. 1,000 bus drivers. I mean, there was a huge, um, strike by 
by bus drivers in, in uh, throughout Iran, uh, something of the magnitude of the Montgomery Montgomery Alabama bus strike that you know became such a such an important part of American history took place in Iran. And, you know, all bus drivers um, quit work, decided not to drive. They wanted a raise, and um, they were the the rest of the international community was consumed by the story of the Muhammad cartoons. So as 1,000 Iranian bus drivers got rounded up, arrested, and taken to prison, almost no one reported on it. And what, it sh what really should have happened was for all labor union unions throughout the world to, to deliver messages of solidarity or do acts of solidarity, all these things that in the past, you know, in the example of you know, the Soviet Union, you know, the Soviet blocs, the, the Eastern <coughs> European blocs, um, throughout history have uh, kind of gotten one revolution, a revolution that has started within, uh, or has been on the verge of starting in one country, to really catch on and become uh, an international fever, failed to happen, on, you know, with this particular case. You've had Iranian women taking to streets uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, as most recently, it was the issue that women were banned from attending soccer matches in stadiums. And, you know, they took to streets and, and they staged a huge march um, demanding only this, that we want to go to soccer stadiums. It wasn't about, you know, equal rights under the law. It wasn't about, you know, wanting to run for judges or any such, you know, grand, grand, um, you know, legitimate other demands. It was just about wanting to go to soccer stadiums. And um, they took to the streets and, and it was a mass demonstration by Iranian women. Well, it wasn't covered because everything that gets coverage these days is all about the nuclear bomb. So what I am in, in essence saying is that not only we are not moving forward with, with the nuclear issue, but as a result of it, we have eclipse. A lot of other, you know, really fantastically important issues that can, uh, in a way, be, um, be a way out, show us an exit out of this, you know, predicament that we've fallen in, into. But unfortunately, um, I think the regime um, wants us focused on the nuclear debate and they take a huge advantage from it, from that particular focus. It, uh, it enables them to really conduct themselves with impunity on, on the domestic scene, um, you know, in, in the absence of any attention from, um, from, from, you know, any press outside. Just let me interrupt for a second. If anyone has a Jeep SUV license plate 785NAM, you're blocking everybody. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get out at this parking lot up above. No one has that? Uh, Gloria, I have to give you a little bit of background. Yeah. I was a dean in Iran when you were a teenager between 1975-79. I was good. <laughs> I want to tell you about the solidarity between this Ashkenazi Litvak and the Sephardic Jews of Tehran. Please. Every Shabbat, every holiday when I was there, I was invited to the Mashadi Sephardic Synagogue. You probably know where it is. And they always insisted they placed me in the seat right next to the president of the synagogue. Even though I could not read Rashi Hebrew, I felt that I was in good company. But let me now get to the issue which I didn't hear you address today. I received this email with this quote from Rabbi Marvin Heer, the dean of the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles. Iran is moving closer and closer to the ideology of the Nazis. And here it is. Human rights groups are raising alarms over a new law, which was passed two years ago, by the Iranian parliament that would require the country's Jews to wear a yellow badge, <coughs> the Christians to wear a red badge, and the Zoroastrians to wear a blue badge. No, no. no. Let, me this is, no uh, let me stop you just for one second, because uh, this is a story that, that originally appeared in a Toronto na national... Post in, it was in, in Canada, right? In Canada, right. It's, it was a hoax, and the, the author had to apologize for it and try to justify himself why he had deduced from certain debates that were going on in the Iranian Majlis 
that this could happen. But anyway, it didn't become law and it isn't law. It isn't law, it is but not. it's impending. Let, let me give you an example. I was there when I counseled many Jewish families to leave Iran. Why? I told them the story of the German Jews and the Austrian Jews who, very, who felt very complacent that nothing would ever happen to them because they were citizens of Germany and Austria. A number of families, you might know some of the families, the Brokeen family, very distinguished family, the Nemetzadas, finally were persuaded to leave Iran. Now, there were 85,000 Iranians when I was there. There are now 25,000 remaining. Why are they there? They are the poor Jews who could not leave the country. Why isn't there an effort, just as we, as Israel moved the Ethiopian Jews to Israel, to get these 25,000 Jews out of the country? They are in mortal danger. And that's my comment. Uh, I don't disagree. I think I think the Jewish community can can given given uh, the sentiments of the president uh, and his rhetoric become some sort of political pawn. I agree. But are you saying? But but to say um, and let me challenge you here sure. because this is what we have to do. It's Yale University um, <laughs> uh, by saying that I think. It doesn't help us, and, and, and it's inaccurate to, um, and it doesn't provide any insight to say Ahmadinejad is another Hitler. It, he isn't another Hitler. He wants to sound like a Hitler. He is hoping to be taken as seriously as Hitler. Um, and he is dangerous, but he's not Hitler. Because the one thing that doesn't make him Hitler is the fact that he is coming 30 years after the rise of Ayatollah Khomeini. Maybe had he come 30 years ago in 1980, when the public really wanted you know, uh, to embrace uh, a new idea, a new lifestyle, a, you know, new, a new ways of you know, dealing with the world, uh, he, would have, he would have had a different chance. But he's coming 30 years late. Uh, he's coming at a time when, when the, the entire public, uh, the seventy percent of whom is under the age of thirty, is sick and tired of politics. Period. You know. In fact, when they see me, they say, "Go away! I don't want to see you because you are the generation who who took to the streets and and overthrew the Shah, who wasn't so bad after all." You know. And and what do they want? They, they don't have grand political social ambitions, they want discos, you know? They want to hold their girlfriend's hands and walk on the streets. Much to my own dismay, they're not a really politically sophisticated, don't have really grand, you know, visions about the Iranian society or the future. They just want little things. They want to have enough money to be able to move out of their parental homes and make a house for themselves. And they can't give a hoot about the Palestinians because they believe that their government is selling them out in the interest of, of a cause in which they don't feel themselves invested whatsoever. And I think, yes, the Jews of Iran are in mortal danger because there's a crazy man at the helm who may use them as a political pawn. And yes, I think they're probably extremely poor, old, and for one reason or another, don't think that they can leave or have the means to leave. Uh, but at the same time, we have to remember that the Jewish problem is an extension of a larger problem from which the uh, er, entire Iranian community is suffering. We have, as Jews, aren't being singled out as, as just one group of people and, and squeezed out and, and you know, uh, discriminated against. This is a disease. Um, that especially after 30 years, uh, the majority of average secular Iranian Muslims are extremely disenchanted with. And I think it's very important to remember that. Hey, you've told us about the poor reporting from Iran. How much news is getting into Iran? Depends what you have access to. You know, there's um, I hear that Tehran is a, is a hub, uh, is an internet, you know, wireless hub. So 
you know, if you have a um, wireless laptop and your laptop is capable, then you can open it up anywhere in Tehran and, and just log on and, and cruise the net. Um, so it depends on what you have access to. If you have access to uh, the internet, there's a lot of news. Now, another thing, you know, everybody keeps kind of uh, banging Iranians on the head with this, saying, you don't have a serious opposition. Where is your political opposition? If the regime is so bad, you know, where are your organizations to overthrow them and your, you know, leaders and oppositions? Whereas, I, I assure you, none of, none of us, nobody, in, you know, pre-Perestroika uh, could have, you know, even known that there was a Gorbachev in the horizon. You know, I think, you know, after a while, he, when he came out, he caught everybody pretty much by surprise, and then we, we all decided that, you know, he was a great man. But Iran is, is on that, uh, you know, in, in a very similar situation in the sense that, you know, never in history of Iran, and I want to know if other people can, can point to another instance, there, there are, have, have there been 22 exile television stations that are beaming into Iran from abroad, you know, with, with content that is totally anti-regime. Or at least, you know, the majority of the content being, being totally anti-regime. I mean, there are people broadcasting, Iranian exiles broadcasting uh, from, from Great Britain, from Los Angeles, from, there's, you know, one of the most popular uh, radio programs in Iran, listened to by millions, is the Persian uh, voice of Israel that that gets beamed into Iran, you know, three, two times a day. Uh, there are Iranians who call. You know, there is a call-in show on the Israeli uh, Persian Voice of Israel program um, that it, it's flooded with calls all the time by Iranians who listen to it all the time, and and oftentimes uh, the person who the interviewer has to answer calls which come in from average Iranians throughout Iran saying, when will you come and bomb our leaders? <laughs> well, really, that's not our plan. <laughs> so would you please tell them to come and bomb our leaders? You know? um, I mean, it's absurd, but it's true. So, so there is a wide variety of, you know, your, your uh, uh, just regular, you know, Deutsche Welle, VOA Persian section, BBC Pers Persian section, and then in addition to that, um, some couple of dozen uh, exile broadcasts uh, that beam into Iran on a regular basis. So if you have a dish in Iran, uh, you, you can watch anything. And the regime tried to basically uh, uh, you know, uh, find people for the dishes for many, many years. So people had to take them off their roof tops and plant them uh, among their bushes uh, in the courtyard or you know, find a good way of hiding hiding the, the satellite dishes so that they won't be seen, so they wouldn't be fine. But it's been uh, another one of those ongoing battles with the public. How do you uh, respond to the contention that your argument can be turned on its head? That is that as the reform movement grows and the regime feels more and more vulnerable, it will be tempted to, one, engage in nuclear or other foreign adventurism to unite the nation and or to engage in anti-Semitism, which is always in fashion, mm -hmm. so as to, to find a scapegoat. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, reform itself can give rise to, to the very things that you think reform can ameliorate. But, but, but that you can make that argument about reform about anywhere, you know, fair and, enough. you know, so you would say, you know, I can't step out of my apartment because I can get hit by a bus. Yes, you know, okay. that's, that's always um, a, a chance that societies run um, because they want to do something great. That's, that's you know, sort of the existential uh, comment you can make on, you know, about anything when, when we want change. I think the important thing is, is actually not even Iran within the next 10 years. Look, Iran has provided a movement that, that because we're living through it, we're unaware of its significance. Uh, you know, Islam is, is the newest of the, of the three monotheistic religions, and it hasn't undergone 
the sort of uh, reforms that you know Judaism and Christianity have experienced, you know, by virtue of in part being um, having more years on on Islam. And uh, what has begun in Iran is is an enlightenment uh, in in that will affect the history of Islam as we know it for the next several hundred years. The most interesting, intriguing debates in Islamic philosophy are, have begun in Iran and are going on in the Islamic world because of the movement that began in Iran. I mean, Iran didn't just, because Iran exported a, a fanatic like Ayatollah Khomeini, it is that Iranian Islamic intellectuals have taken it upon themselves to become introspective and to really look at, you know, why they have been the hotbed of, of zealots such as him. So I think in, in, in the long run, it's very important, you know, to look, to look at this, you know, layer of, you know, we have Khomeini, we have Ahmadinejad, and we have all these characters. But also, the unreported story at the bottom is that uh, some of the most intriguing uh, debates that are going on in the Islamic world have originated from Iran uh, regarding the reform of Islam as a religion. I'm sorry you look unhappy. No. I'm unhappy because you're so relentlessly optimistic. transferred out of a Jewish school and I was in a regular school um, which was predominantly Muslim uh, were separated so you had stalls for Muslims and you had stalls for non muslims so um, usually when I say this everybody goes ooh and ah and <laughs> you seem to be so quiet um, but anyway you know it's it was it was quite a shock and and of course a profound disappointment uh, to me because you know, these were stories that even my parents hadn't heard of, you know, since they were very, very young. So, you know, it, it looked as if, you know, we had gone through two or three generations and gone back to where we had started from. But, the truth is, they did separate the bathrooms, but none of my classmates <laughs> followed the rule. I, I went to the Muslim-only bathrooms and took a piss every day. <laughs> they, they crossed the way and went to our bathrooms all the time. We washed uh, our hands in, you know, in each other's sinks. And after a while, the, you know, the school authorities realized that we just ain't going to do it. What, what I think is significant in the case of Iran is that the regime has been far more radical than the population that is ruling. And, and I think this is the problem of the Iranian regime with respect to the Jews, that they really do want to jumpstart and get the population on, you know, doing a whole bunch of really bad things to, to the religious minorities. But so far, um, the public, by and large, hasn't done a syst the kind of systematic um, acts that it would take to really create a crisis. Now, there have been, there have been um, acts of vandalism, there have been 
you know, uh, exhibitions. Sorry, Holocaust cartoon exhibitions. Exactly. You know, but how many people do you think went to see it? You know, they they post this because you're talking about a, a, a you know a, a Tehran as a sophisticated capital with a lot of really great art galleries and you know sophisticated art art scene goers ain't gonna go to you know. Uh, to the car Holocaust cartoon exhibits, which is precisely uh, the sort of recording that came out of the uh, New York Times stringer who was covering the story. Said, yes, you know, there is a cart Holocaust cartoon exhibit here, but nobody's coming to see it. Right. You know, which was, which was right, Jim? Yeah. <coughs> That's what you read. Um, so I think, I think it's very important be for us, because to, sh to show that there is a pessimistic situation, um, is, is what you get every day in the paper. What I'm trying to do is to say that this very pessimistic situation has highly complex and sophisticated aspects that if you really truly open it up and look at it, you'll see that um, it's, it's, there's news in there, there's, there's surprise in there, and, and we owe it to ourselves um, to, to be just, uh, to be just reporters and just witnesses. Let me accept the notion that 70% of the population wants discos and a good life and business. Uh, yet, when we look at the history, we had a reform movement which petered out. Party didn't do very well, they weren't very effective. But it also, when it came to the next election, it was rigged. The election was rigged, so the people... This election? The last election. It wasn't rigged. Well, I thought the people who were allowed to run were not exactly... But that has been the story of elections in Iran since yeah, the beginning. Yeah, right. So it was another week election, yeah. right. And, and the, the people who were running it were the mullahs, the Aratoya. So my question to you really is, knowing what you know about Iranian society, where do you think the, the, the Gorbachevs are going to come from out of the woodwork? Is it going to from the military? Is it going to come from the young intellectuals? I mean, do you have any, I mean, you're not a prophet, I know. But if you had to... Uh, Give me some indication where this... I know several Gorbachevs. You know? Uh, I know a couple of Gorbachevs among the youth. I know a couple of really, really old Gorbachevs from the National um, Front Movement who kind of hung around and, and have survived. Um, you know, because the National Front is, is the party from which Mossadegh came. Mossadegh being the very popular prime minister who came to power uh, in, in the early 50s and, you know, who's, uh, who was overthrown and then, you know, the, the, uh, the whole crisis that, that took place um, and uh, the, the coup of 1953 is because of the overthrow of Mossadegh. Well, Mossadegh represented a party and his party still exists. So there are some old timers from Mossadegh's time who are, you know, one, of, one or two of whom are, are quite well respected nowadays. Now, I don't know if, if there would be a single person who can do this, but I think there, is, uh, there could potentially be a coalition of all of these characters um, who, can, who can be a, um, you know, a serious opposition at some point. I think the, the, most important, uh, the most important factor here is um, for, for the negotiations to, to take place uh, not, so much, not with Iran, but with the international community, to find a way of putting all the pressure possible um, on, on the government of Iran and, and really uh, delivering a message of solidarity with, you know, when there is a labor strike with, you know, the bus workers, with the teachers unions, with, you know, various elements uh, within the Iranian society who, uh, who seem to be really cut off from the world because the rest of the world doesn't seem to take any interest in anything but, but you know, the nuclear issue. But, but there are. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, you know, I think, I think in, in every uh, group or, you know, strata of society that you look at, there are uh, uh, one or two really interesting individuals um, who can potentially um, you know, 
be leaders, or at least a coalition of whom can be can be a serious coalition. Who is the military loyalty? Uh, who's, the I'm military. Sorry. In the military, who no, I mean, the military is presumably another possible place for sure. the notions of a Gorbachev. Yeah. Who are they loyal to? The president or the Ayatollah? Uh, well, the, pre the, it, the military has always been really loyal um, to a sense of the government uh, and a government that was dedicated to the nation. And that's in part the reason why the regime initially went about establishing the so-called Revolutionary Guards. Because they wanted another group of you know, armed men who would be exclusively dedicated to them. And so one of the problems today is that we, we have um, parallel and competing uh, military or armed entities operating inside Iran. Mm -hmm. Military, the military could be and has been really to some degree loyal to, to some sense of nationhood uh, and you know, sort of sense of government and therefore uh, the dirty jobs that they've had to do um, has gone on with the help of the Revolutionary Guards. In fact, uh, a lot of the overseas operations that they have done, you know, helping the Hezbollah terrorists and everything, has, has happened through, um, through the Revolutionary Guards. <coughs> so it's, it's really, uh, the Revolutionary Guards is in essence a serious obstacle, has been a serious obstacle to positive movement in Iran. Yes? How large is the Iranian military? Do Jews serve and is it compulsory? No. No, uh, Jews cannot serve. Uh, there are uh, Iranian laws have uh, made it very uh, difficult for religious minorities to um, um, ten percent of whom are are Muslim Sunnis to um, gain any sort of credible uh, academic, military, or professional advantage in Iran. So Jews cannot serve. Uh, in, in the army and I think uh, the last Iranian Jewish uh, university professor uh, resigned a few years ago and there is no, there are no Jews in the academia anymore. Uh, but you, you know, I, I wanted to also mention that um, you know, among the religious minorities in Iran, Muslim Sunnis uh, are also considered a religious minority and suffer uh, pretty much from the same restrictions. And how large is the military? Um, I don't want to, I don't want to say because I, I can't think of an accurate number. Uh, what, what I think is important about the situation of uh, the military in Iran is that it's, uh, it is not the only uh, armed power in, in, in Iran. That uh, the regime very early on um, built another entity that is dedicated to its own ideology and, uh, and is extremely brutal uh, called the Revolutionary Guards, which is a competing entity. What is the uh, view of uh, Judaism in Islamic Iran? That is, the, the, the Islamists in Iran, how do they uh, regard Judaism as, as it different than in other Islamic <coughs> countries? Um, I can't, uh, I don't want to comment on other countries because I don't know okay. them as well as Iran. Um, with, in Iran, um, um, I, early on, especially as a result of this meeting I mentioned with Ayatollah Khomeini, um, Khomeini declared uh, three religious minorities as people of the book. Um, the Christians, the Jews, and interestingly enough, the Zoroastrians, who actually aren't <laughs> people of the book. But uh, because Zoroastrianism was the original religion of Iran, and you know there are a lot of Zoroastrian uh, festivities and rituals that Iranians still observe. Um, he just didn't want to pick, up, pick a fight with Zoroastrians, so he just, you know, bunched them up together and said they're also people of the book. Um, because he, he made it that distinction, he made that distinction, um, with it came, um, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, certain entitlements. For instance, uh, Jews in Iran are have Jewish schools. You know, we have synagogues. Um, we have you know several Jewish schools throughout Tehran. But the catch is, uh, the schools can no longer operate uh, with Jewish administrators. So in in these in these fundamentally Jewish schools, uh, the administrators are, are Muslim. Um, they don't they don't prevent you from teaching Hebrew to the students, but they really strongly discourage you uh, because they don't like um, to to feel that there is uh, a conversation going on in a language that they're not really privy to. Um, so they prefer they have no problem with religious studies as long as it's done in Persian, that they can have access to its contents. Um, the, and the religious material that is being taught, uh, by and large, uh, are texts that the, uh, either the Department of Education puts out, or uh, are, are texts that the Department of Education has to approve. Um, and the schools have to be open on Saturdays, which was unheard of in my time. You know, we, you know, we just had Saturday off, and we were extremely spoiled in that way. Um, Maybe take one more question. Sure. Actually, if we have to sure. So, so I mean, just just to uh, quickly address this, there, there are because there uh, Jews are considered people of the book, and they allowed a certain existence, but this existence um, is in many ways hampered by the limitations that they put on on it. Right. You didn't comment about Khomeini's persecution of the Baha'i. Yes. Why? Why didn't I comment? Right. Because I was talking about Jews. <laughs> uh, the Baha'is are in, are in you know, terrible, uh, mortal danger. I think you know the Baha'i situation could uh, be considered uh, you know a crime against humanity by by people who um, are are the experts in the field and you know and deal with it. I think. Um, it's, it's a shame that the world community is uh, not more enlightened and aware of the crimes that have taken place in, you know, against the Baha'is in Iran, which uh, should not be happening in the 20th and the 21st century. Thanks. Yes, I didn't take a question from you. Okay. Uh, yeah. I was wondering if you commented a bit about the women's movement. I know that there were shadow reports submitted from the Iraqi women's organization. Some of those women were in prison. Uh, there are problems with, I think, the Nobel Prize with a woman who has been speaking out. And uh, one is, do the Jews um, outside of Iran uh, unite with the civil human rights Jews and the deal, people like that within Iran? And also whether or not that leads you well, I think, I think you know. Actually, this goes back to, to the comment, to the question that Gus had uh, about you know who are the opposition leaders that you can really point to. Um, well, that can be sort of tough, but what's really easy to point to is to say, look at an entire category of people women in this case, who have been the most serious, persistent uh, opposition groups that the, that the regime has ever had in all of its history. And, and probably uh, the most serious challenge and the most moderated um, force within the Iranian society have been women. Because, you know, um, just, just you know, don't take my word for it, just look at the way um, Iranian women uh, treat the the forced or mandatory dress code, which is a scarf, a uniform that's supposed to be baggy and you know cover up to your you know, your knees and, and you know pair of pants underneath, closed toed shoes and everything. Look at look at every picture that comes out of Iran, you know, on, on the wires. You have these women who have this tiny kerchief around their heads, you know, they have their bangs kind of coming out this way and you know they're the ponytails coming out the other way, great makeup, you know, and then they have decided that, you know, the length of the Islamic dress code doesn't need to be 
uh, all the way down to their knees. It can be, you know, just barely under their butts. And, and it doesn't need to be really baggy. It can be extremely narrow and, and show all the curves that they have. So they have actually uh, it deconstructed, <laughs> to borrow Charles's term, uh, the, the concept of Islamic dress code to the point that I think one of these days the mullahs will say, you know, stop doing this and just, you know, go without for heaven's sake because this is far worse, uh, suggestive and, and just really uh, attention catching. I think that uh, the women as a gender have, have served as, a, as the most reformist um, uh, element within the Iranian society because uh, just by virtue of who they have been and, and how they have operated, they have managed to um, be the most serious challenge to the regime. And now I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. for just one minute. Um, the conversation to continue informally. We're going to have some wine and drinks here. And Roya has agreed to sign some books if anybody's interested. And just to let you know, next week, uh, Professor Milton Shane is coming to the University of Cape Town, which is um, an interesting case study maybe of uh, Jewish involvement in larger issues. So significant minority of Jews are engaged in the anti-apartheid movement. And since it was interesting, I don't um, So anyway, so I want to thank you very much for a very and important uh, Thank you.